Hey, Lincoln. Hello, Kevin. How are you doing? Good. Looks like we're getting some folks rolling in. That's always good news. Yes. And, and Izzy, you're going to record it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it should be recording already. Can you and see that I, as well? It looks like I can share my screen, Izzy, but not while you're doing it. So it's I can't override your screen share. So when you disable, I'll be able to do it. Oh, gotcha. OK, sounds good. Yeah. Yep, I'll be sure to disable that when your part starts. I think we got about three inches of snow in Montpelier. <laughs> Yeah. Really? Yeah. Not super exciting. Mostly rain in Hanover, but okay. a little bit of snow um, last night or the night before, I guess. And now, Kevin, where where are you in the region? I'm, I'm in Pomfret. Pomfret. Okay. Yeah. So we got, yeah, you know, it ended up being maybe two inches here or something. Yep. Yeah. Kind of wet stuff, but. Everything got white. Yeah, it's pretty. You forget how pretty snow is. <laughs> it was just in time for some of the ski areas. Absolutely. Yeah, I think with Thanksgiving around the corner, I mean, things must be trying to open up soon as possible, I'd imagine. Yeah. So do you have to let folks in, Izzy, or are they just coming in? They're just coming in. No okay. waiting room. Cool. And do you remember how to grab the, the, the uh, archive, the chat? Mm, um, I haven't seen, I haven't done that one on Zoom. Yeah, I see. I, I see on my screen a button that says save chat. Okay. Potentially that could work. I might also have the option at the end to save the chat. Oh. Once oh. I end the meeting. Okay. So I'm just going to go ahead and put my name in the chat for everybody. So if, if folks can just put their name in their chat and the um, organization or town or any affiliation they have, that'd be great. That's a way we can kind of remember who is here.
So Izzy and Lincoln, you want to give them just a couple more minutes for folks to come in? Okay. Sounds yeah, good I think to that me. Yeah, good. we just, just hit the top of the hour here. <laughs> yeah, maybe give it like two or three more minutes and then we can get rolling. We're just, for those who are here, we're just giving it a couple more minutes while everybody comes on in. That's good. Looks like we've got about maybe 24 people in. Yeah, let's, let's do it when, whenever okay. you're ready, Izzy. All right, awesome, yeah. Um, well, hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us this evening. Welcome to this forest block training developed and run by Two Rivers Ottaquichi Regional Commission. Uh, also in partnership with the Vermont Fish and Wildlife yeah. Department. Oh, I'm not on camera. All right. Um, TROC is an association of 30 municipalities in East Central Vermont, many of which are represented tonight. Uh, and we work closely with town leadership, both to advocate uh, and plan for the present and future needs of member towns, especially when it comes to land use, which is our focus tonight. So before we get into the content of tonight's training, we're gonna do a quick round of introductions. I'll start us off. My name is Izzy and I'm an intern at TRORC this fall. I've been focusing on forests, subdivisions and future land use planning. I've spent the past several weeks researching and working closely with other staff members to develop this training. And outside of TRORC, I'm a junior at Dartmouth College. I'm studying anthropology and I grew up in Massachusetts, but I'm currently from North Carolina. Uh, Lincoln, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Izzy. My name is Lincoln Frasca. Good to see everybody. I'm a conservation planning specialist with Vermont Fish and Wildlife, and I live in Montpelier. We do uh, municipal technical assistance to towns all across the state, a lot of trainings and webinars just like this, especially this time of year. Um, so excited to be on here with Two Rivers and talk about some forests. So I'm Kevin Geiger. I'm the Director of Planning at the Two Rivers out of Quichi Regional Commission. Thanks to you all for coming tonight. Uh, we're your Regional Planning Commission if you are from this area in Vermont. Um, but if you're from elsewhere, this stuff is probably relevant as well. Uh, we go up to Newbury. I think I saw a Newbury person here over to Granville, down to Plymouth, where I saw somebody from Plymouth too, and then across to Heartland, those 30 towns. And so I think I'll just call on people because it always gets a little awkward here. And then just remind people, if you're not talking, to hit that little mute button up top. Um, okay, let's see. I have Ernie. Ernie, you want to go next? Sure. Uh, I'm Ernie Ciccatelli. I'm on the Planning Commission in Norwich, Vermont. Great. Thanks, Ernie. And Don? Hi, I'm Donald Graham. I'm on the Planning Commission in Stratford. And Deborah? Hi, um, I'm on the um, Conservation Commission in Moncton. Oh, great. Moncton's not one of our towns, but a Vermont town. No. So all, <laughs> all, all applies. Uh, Peter Anderson. Peter Anderson from the Royalton Planning Commission. 
Uh, Eric Webb. Eric Webb, <clears throat> uh, Bethel Planning Commission. Great. Kate, Kate Reeves. Kate Reeves from Barnard, Vermont Planning Commission. Wonderful. Uh, Danny Dover. I'm uh, Conservation Commission in Bethel. Hi, Danny. John Moore. Hey, John. Uh, Planning Commission, Pomfret. Uh, M. Shipman. Hi, I'm from Bradford, Vermont, and I'm with the Bradford Food and Forest Committee. Oh, good. Uh, John McCann. I am from the Rutland region, the Mount Holly Planning Commission Chair. Oh, good. Over the mountain. Yep. Uh, Lauren Ludwig. Hi, uh, I'm Lauren Ludwig. I'm on the Fairleigh Town Forest Board. And Brad Saltzman. Hey, Brad. Hi, Kevin. Uh, in this role, Conservation Commission in Royalton. Great. Peggy Hughes. Larry Scott. Oh, that's, that's actually Larry. Hey, Larry. Hi, Kevin. Um, from Planning Commission in Newbury and, and the DRB board. Hey, Larry. Uh, Sabina. Hi, I'm on the Jericho Planning Commission and Conservation Commission. Excellent. We're getting a few from around the state. Wonderful. Uh, Robin. Hi, I'm Robin Mosher. I'm on conservation for Heartland. And Claudia. Hi, I'm Claudia McClough. I'm from the Conservation Commission in Charlotte. Okay. Emily. Hi, Emily. Emily, can you hear us? I see you turned your you turned your mute off there for a second. Yeah. We can't hear you though. I'll come back. Ann Miller. Um hi, I'm I'm on the Conservation Commission in Moncton. Great. Jackie Allen. Yeah, hi, Jackie Allen. I'm on the uh, Planning Commission for Norwich. Ann Kroll Lerner. So Anne, either Anne or uh, Emily, if you can unmute yourself, say hi. Uh, I see Emily going off a of mute and Anne going off a of mute. Can either one of you? Yep, I can. Anne oh. Coral Lerner, Jericho Conservation Commission. Oh, there we got you. And Emily, I think Emily may still be having trouble with audio because I'm not hearing you, Emily, if you're hearing us. Okay, thanks everybody. Um, just a reminder, if you're not talking, um, just to keep yourself on mute. Um, so, so Peter Anderson, if you can just hit your mute there, great. And away we go. I'll be monitoring the chat. And that's about it for me. Sounds great. Thanks, Kevin. Um, so wanted to just walk us through um, an outline of the presentation. This presentation has five parts. First, Lincoln is going to talk about forest blocks habitat connectors and why we care about them. Next, I'll talk about the planning requirements, subdivision bylaws, what they are and how they can be helpful, and then the specifics of subdivision planning. And lastly, I'll touch on the concept of rural density and I'll provide some helpful visuals as well. So Lincoln's part of the presentation is the why, why all this matters, and my parts more concerned the what and the how of subdivision bylaws for future land use planning. So that's going to be about what you can do as town members and leaders and how you can go about it. Um, Lincoln, Kevin and I are going to stick around after the presentation to answer any questions that you might have. So feel free to use the chat function to ask questions throughout the presentation. And like Kevin said, he'll be monitoring that. Uh, or at the end, you can unmute yourself. But like Kevin said, please remain muted until then. And before we begin, I wanted to summarize our goals for this training. So the goals are to emphasize the importance of forest blocks and habitat connectors, outline the state planning goal and town requirements, 
explain the purpose of subdivisions as well as their impacts, clarify the concept of rural density, and use maps to visualize outcomes. And then this last one in bold, because most, it's the most important, um, our goal is to prepare two rivers out of Ottaquichi towns to create effective and ecologically conscious town plans that address forest blocks and habitat connectors and subdivision bylaws that protect forest blocks and allow for sustainable developments in the region. So keep these mind keep these in mind as we go throughout the presentation and I will turn it over to Lincoln. Okay, I will start sharing my screen here. And are you seeing benefits of large forests? Okay. Yep, perfect. Looks good. Yeah, I'll just jump in here. And I wanted to start by kind of talking about the big picture here and highlighting those benefits that we get from Vermont's largest forest blocks. And man, many Vermonters share this value of our forests. Uh, there's economic reasons, ecological reasons, community value reasons, but our forests are really the the literal backbone of our state. And um, I'm just gonna kind of go around and, and talk about these benefits and then we'll hone in on a few of them in the next couple of slides. So first and foremost is we've got um, a large amount of biological diversity in big forest blocks. You know, typically the bigger the block, the more animals, plants, uh, invertebrates that you're gonna find inside of that forest. We get clean air and water from large impact forests. Um, our working lands and the forest industry produces timber, maple sugaring, all these things are kind of staples in our state. Um, the economic benefits of recreation, uh, we see, you know, huge numbers coming in to ski and to see the leaves change every year. Uh, that is thanks to our big intact forests. And also erosion prevention, uh, forest roots, they absorb flood water and they prevent runoff and they kind of mitigate um, the effects of large flood events. And then of course, hunting, fishing, and wildlife viewing. Activities are more fun when the forest is bigger. And we also see less ticks in intact forests. Um, ticks prefer edge habitats and big forests have, have fewer edges. So we, we don't see as many of those in the deep woods. And then also we get the biggest benefits for carbon sequestration and also the most clean air, oxygen produced out of these bigger forests. And then just broadly, we have you know, the community values that come with some of these big forests. Um, and you know the, the value of rural character in our state uh, is something that feels like a, a lot of our identities and what brings people to Vermont so often. So there's this community, there's this economic, and there's this ecological sustainability kind of theme that I'll come back to throughout my segment here. And in conservation planning, it's an important first step to actually identify the large forest, forest blocks in your community and create a plan to keep them intact. So we're gonna zoom in now on the economic benefits of our forest blocks here. Um, so when we think about recreation and tourism, well, that's about 1.9 billion to Vermont's economy every year. And when we think about our forest products, that's another 1.5 billion. And that's also about 12% of Vermont's GDP and roughly 20,000 full-time jobs. Those leaf peepers are about 25% of our tourists and they bring in about 460 million. Hunting, fishing, and wildlife adds another 685 million to the economy. And that's second in the nation to only to Alaska. And then we also have uh, intact wetlands, which contribute immensely to avoided costs during large flooding events. Uh, when we think back to Hurricane Irene, just in Middlebury alone, they saved $2 million in damages thanks to their intact wetlands. So we think about avoided costs too, of problems that we didn't have to deal with thanks to large forests, their wetlands and intact ecosystems. And I'll, I'll pivot now, and we're going to talk a little bit about um, the ecological significance of our largest forests. Okay, so this graph represents the relationship between forest block size and the species that are supported within that block. The bigger blocks of habitat are on the left, that tier one undeveloped, that's an intact forest. 
and then the smaller blocks to, are to the right all the way down to one to 20 acre blocks in tier five. And all those species listed are what you're likely to find or what that size of forest would support. And the overall pattern is undeniable. The bigger blocks of habitat equal more species diversity. And once we get down to that single acre forest, we're left with the squirrels, raccoons, and the skunks. Um, there are exceptions here to the bigger equals better rule. We know there are small forest blocks or wetland areas that are hot spots for diversity, but in general, the bigger habitats are better um, for wildlife and the more forest blocks that are connected, the more wildlife that are going to be able to survive and move freely within them. And let's, let's define forest blocks. So these are areas of continuous habitat that are undeveloped and they're enclosed or surrounded by roads or buildings or agriculture. Uh, but within their boundaries, there, there's nothing stopping just the, the uninhibited forest for habitat within. And um, the size of Vermont's forest blocks are shown on this map. In total, we have 4,052 blocks over 20 acres in Vermont. And this map classifies those blocks by size. The largest ones are the darkest colors and the smaller blocks are lighter yellows and oranges. So we can start to see the pattern on the state level here. The average block size is about a thousand acres and those largest block size, they go over 4,000 and they occur along the spine of the Green Mountains and up in the Northeast Kingdom. So interestingly, biodiversity um, or the number of different species found is actually greater at lower elevations in the valleys in some of these smaller blocks because the climate just isn't as harsh as some of these higher elevation um, or higher latitude um, habitats. But when we, when we talk again about that big picture, the largest forest blocks are gonna kind of have this umbrella effect and, and protect the, the, the um, these species that encompass so many other species with them. So it's all important, but um, size, it, it does play a role here. And we can zoom in on the Two Rivers area here, because that's what we're here to focus on tonight. And we've just zoomed in onto the region's boundaries. And we can immediately see we've got, you know, a large block down here in the Killington area. Uh, and then it gets a little bit uh, less you know, less of a big blocks here in the Randolph kind of valley, upper valley agricultural area. And then you've got some um, larger blocks also when you get closer to the Connecticut River. Um, so really good way to just sort of kind of size up size of forest blocks on a big, big picture level. Now I want to make an important distinction here between trees and forests. Uh, when you drive the Vermont back roads, it's, it's picturesque. We don't have billboards. Um, Vermont's pretty good at tucking away and hiding development. But uh, the trees that you see here, they don't do the same thing as this photo, which is, you know, a large intact forest. Street trees are important. Um, they sequester carbon and they regulate the temperatures in our cities, but they don't provide the same value for wildlife and wildlife connectivity as a large, intact, big block forest. So trees versus forest. Um, so, okay, so talked about sort of the importance of the forests and their values to us and wildlife. And let's just get a little bit more specific now and think about connectivity. So if you were an animal, how, how would you move across this, this image here? Um, well, I'm, I'm going to tell you how they would probably move across the, the image. Uh, they would be trying to, you know, base around these core forest blocks. Uh, this is where they're going to find food and shelter. And for the most part, you know, the, the functions that they need are, are in these larger block areas. But they're not connected. So they need smaller stepping stone forests to get from, you know, forest block A to large forest block B. Now, how do you get to the stepping stones? Well, that, that's when wildlife road crossings come into play. So we have these small patches of forest that are intermittent, but connect from one side of the road to the next, and just so happen to link up the big with the small, back again with the big. And we also have 
stream side connectors and vegetation along streams that can act as corridors for wildlife moving. Sometimes it's just a hedgerow even that bobcats or fox or coyote will use to get from you know, one forest to the next. Um, so I'm gonna show you now a real, real example of a large ranging mammal traveling across our Southern landscape here. This is a male bear uh, named M0063 for tracking purposes. And it show, this shows how widespread movement around the landscape can be. So starting around the Southern border and North Adams there, uh, this bear traveled 90 miles to Brattleboro and then back. So we have the return trip as well as the, uh, the travel to Brattleboro recorded here. It did not cross Route 9, as you can see, but it did cross 100 multiple times. And, um, you know, without those wildlife road crossings this, or, or those forests that were connected on either side of the road, this, this bear would not have been able to successfully complete this journey. And we don't know if it was a stressful food year um, or if they were just looking for a mate, but it's really besides the matter because these trips are happening. They're regular occurrences. We know that is going on and these animals are making these huge movements. So we as planners, we need to think about connectivity, not just in our town, but on a regional scale. Um, so to complicate the matter is climate change. And the Nature Conservancy has put out this um, digital, you know, moving image map of um, about 3,000 species that are adapting and moving a mile every year north because of climate change. And this is the route that they'll be taking. And Vermont is somewhere in this area here. And you can see how many of those lines overlap with our state. And we're really at this crossroads um, for these, these regional movements that are gonna be um, exacerbated by climate change, pushing animals north to find more suitable climates. So again, we, you know, we have to understand what, what is happening now currently, what movement is looking like and think about what it could look like and the stresses that are on wildlife and plants as they as they have to find a new suitable climate. So in Vermont, we at the Fish and Wildlife Department have been working on a project that prioritizes conservation of large intact and diverse forests. And we call it the Vermont Conservation Design. BioFinder, some of you as planners maybe are already familiar with, is a free online mapping site that brings the layers of Vermont conservation design together and allows you to look at where you live and the places that you're planning for. So on this map at left here, we have the dark green forest blocks are the highest priority areas and the lighter green are priority. Now they're all important, um, but the areas that are listed as highest priority are areas that we have enough data on that we're able to confirm that they are essential to maintain the ecological function now and into the future. So what I'm going to show you next is a layer of BioFinder that is a forest blocks and looks at the Two Rivers region. Um, so the darker areas here are those priority forest blocks. And we can see the concentration along the Green Mountains and to the east. And there's sort of that gap there with the agricultural areas and that Randolph Upper Valley area. And we can zoom in further and we can see what the biggest barriers in your region are to wildlife movement, I-89 and I-91. Um, and we can see where the forest blocks, the priority large forest blocks wanna connect across 89. So now we're gonna turn this layer off and turn on the connectivity blocks layer on BioFinder. And I have circled that area where the forest blocks were trying to connect across 89. And if we zoom in further, we can get town boundaries. And we can see that the northeast border of Barnard into Royalton and then into Sharon um, is the path for wildlife traveling northeast across your region. They sort of come to this fork in the road right here where they either have to take the Green Mountains or they have to go northeast. Um, so this 
this crossing, uh, you know, across 89, this sort of pinch point um, is, is critical for wildlife movement um, in your region and then also larger, you know, across, across state boundaries. Another layer that offers is just the wildlife road crossings. Kind of looks like a spider's nest in there. Um, but these are terrestrial and aquatic road crossings. And we need this information for planning as well. Uh, the darker lines represent those highest priority crossings. We're working on updating and getting more um, data on this layer currently. Uh, if you don't have enough information here to necessarily you know, regulate from, but it is a starting point and you could find those priority crossings in your area and then do a field check of what they actually look like on the ground and then make your decisions going forward. So I'm um, wrapping up my section here, but I wanted to show the overall priority map. So uh, just to be clear, we were looking at individual layer maps of the Two Rivers area, forest block, connectivity, and then wildlife road crossings. But this, it, this you know, dark and light green map here brings all those layers together on conservation design in BioFinder. And the, these show the most important lands and waters for maintaining the ecological function, excuse me. So this is the, this is the big picture map that I'm ending with. And, um, you know, Ver Vermont, we're, we're at the center, we're at the crossroads for these movements, our, our economy, um, our ecology and our community relies on our large forests. So hopefully you have uh, seen the value in identifying and mapping and managing the habitat blocks, and wildlife corridors in your town. And I am now going to pass the baton to Izzy to uh, take, take it from here and, and talk about how we can plan with this information. So Lincoln, do you want to entertain any questions now? Or? Oh, before I pass it off. Yes, thank you, Kevin. Any, I, any questions? I, I do see one in the chat from, from okay. Robin, which, Robin, which says, what can we do to make it safer and easier for such animals to do road crossings? Well, that is a great question. Thank you. Uh, there are many different examples uh, across the state of, of how to make road crossings uh, safer. Um, you know, we know for sure that the, uh, you know, moose next 20 mile sign doesn't do much. Um, but there are, you know, under the road crossings and um, culverts. And when we work closely with VTRANS, and when there, it's time to uh, repair a bridge or install new culverts, we're always trying to make those wider. Um, that's good for not only wildlife crossing but, uh, and, and fish and aquatic crossings, but also um, flood mitigation and resilience on that level. So out west, you see a lot of the, you know, those overpasses over the land crossings are kind of big out there. We don't... Um, it doesn't make as much sense here to do something like that uh, just because of the amount of, you know, we don't have those huge swaths of land like they do out West. Um, so we, we have to find a different model, but under the road crossings, uh, awareness in your community. And um, then there are also unique examples. Um, I know we have folks from Moncton with us, but they did an amphibian crossing for salamanders. And that was, uh, that was very successful. Um, like in the 90% range of success that we're just finding out now. So I hope that answers your questions a little bit. There are a lot of options and it is um, often site specific. Wonderful. If anybody else has a question, um, you can, if you go to reactions down the bottom of your screen and you would, uh, if you click that, you'll see things and you could raise your digital hand, which will make a little yellow hand go up like that, just going up and then you'd hit it again and then that lowers it. Or you can actually turn your uh, video on and, and ask a question right now. There'll be plenty of time for more questions later, though, too. Okay. Anything else okay. in the chat before I, I don't? Hand I, it I don't see anything else in the chat, so let's go to Izzy. Okay. There you go, Izzy. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Awesome. Great. I'll share mine. You should be able to see my screen now, is that right? Yep. Awesome, just gotta get to, to my slide. 
Okay. Does that say town planning requirement for you guys too? Great. Okay. So thanks so much, Lincoln. Um, that was great. Uh, now we're going to pivot a bit to the town planning requirements, which includes what needs to be in your town plan and how that aligns with the goals of the state. So first off, towns don't have to make a town plan, but if they do, it must follow this section 4382. So according to the section of Vermont state law, the land use plan needs to indicate those areas identified by the state, the regional planning commission, or the municipality that requires special consideration for the maintenance of forest blocks, wildlife habitat, and habitat connectors. And it also needs to incorporate plans to minimize forest fragmentation, as it says there in uh, point D of section 4382. Furthermore, if you want your town to get regional approval, it must meet this goal of section 4302, uh, which is to maintain and improve forest blocks and habitat connectors. And just to kind of orient us here and remind us of the larger goal that we're chasing, uh, especially if in pursuit of regional approval, Vermont law states that bylaws, both for zoning and subdivision, are adopted for the purposes set forth in section 4302, which I just read on the last slide, uh, the most relevant being number six, to maintain and improve the quality of air, water, wildlife, and land resources. So now you should have a clear understanding of the goals that your towns are working towards and also the requirements of your town plans. Essentially, you need to consider forest blocks and habitat connectors in your town plan. Uh, and these next two sections on the subdivision bylaws and planning should outline how exactly you can fulfill those requirements and achieve those goals. So subdivision bylaws deal with subdivisions, which are the creation of new property boundary lines and lots. They're adopted and administered just like zoning bylaws, and they can be combined with zoning bylaws. Um, to create something called a unified bylaw. Importantly, subdivision bylaws can be scaled so that they only kick in at certain sizes or certain number of lots, pace of lots, and so on. This point is important to remember because subdivision bylaws don't need to be a one-size-fits-all or even a one-size-fits-most thing. There's flexibility and opportunity to meet the varying needs of your town within your town uh, for example, as the last bullet point there says, subdivision bylaws can have differing standards by district. Also, uh, wanted to provide a bit of a warning that towns that have both zoning and subdivision become a 10 acre town under Act 250, meaning that the protections of Act 250 only kick in once you have 10 or more lots in a parcel uh, instead of six. And this makes a compelling case for writing stronger and more effective subdivision bylaws because the protections under Act 250 may not always be triggered, which would leave a town's bylaws as one of the only sources of protection. So something to keep in mind there. Also wanted to clarify the difference between subdivision and zoning. So, Zoning bylaws are about the what, while subdivision bylaws are gonna be about the where. And what this means is that zoning refers to districts with specific purposes, uh, think commercial or residential districts. And subdivision is about how and specifically where you're cutting up the land. So if you're only doing zoning, you are often too late to protect many of the natural resources that we want to protect. And uh, in rural areas, regulating subdivision is a much better way to ensure all of these bullet points here. Uh, I wanna draw your attention to the fourth bullet point here, that land is not needlessly fragmented. 
which we're going to talk a lot more about in a little bit. So through the regulation of lot line placement, roads, utilities, and buildings, and also the use of clustering or density requirements, which is a concept that we'll get to shortly, rural style subdivisions can still be achieved, uh, preserving both the landowner's value, potentially even increasing it, and also preserving the ecological value, which we care a lot about. Okay, so now for some specifics on subdivision planning. Subdivision, like zoning, begins in the town plan. And the town plan should recommend adopting subdivision bylaws if you want to have them. The town plan can provide background on the ecological, agricultural, forestry, uh, and rural character values of the lands uh, and other values as well. Um, it can also set policies on the protection of each of those to form the basis for later regulatory standards. And lastly, the town plan should clarify the main goal, which is to preserve forest blocks and minimize forest fragmentation. And when possible, it's important and useful to include that language there and include the words or phrases forest blocks and forest fragmentation, as well as explain them. So fragmentation, uh, I'll define this concept here. This fragmentation results from disjointed land ownership. Uh, and these are patterns that disrupt landscape, habitats, plant and animal species, and more. There will be some helpful visuals for this in just a moment. So these are two examples of language that you can use in your town plan to protect forest blocks and minimize forest fragmentation, either with emphasis on cluster planning, which is the first example, uh, or which you can see in the first example, uh, or you can um, use language that emphasizes the conservation of open spaces, which is in the second example. I'm not gonna read those word for word, definitely feel free to right now, um, wanted you to have them for reference. And do note that number two could also become a regulatory standard. And uh, uh, so lastly, uh, note that this language could be firmer if desired. When you write the bylaw, you can tighten this, you can improve it and shape it to fit your town's needs and values. So we know that subdivision always fragments the land. Some degree of fragmentation is unavoidable. That being said, poor lot design can unnecessarily chop up the land, limiting its future use for agriculture or forestry uh, or conservation in our case. So I'm sure the two images below are familiar and I'm gonna uh, offer a bit of a metaphor to you. So if we were to chop up the Mona Lisa or a car right in half, right down the middle, what would be the result? You know, you could stitch the pieces of the Mona Lisa back together perhaps, but it would never be the same priceless work of art. And similarly, if you chopped a car in half, its functionality would be severed. It just wouldn't work. And the same idea applies to the land, which I'm gonna explain in just a moment. Okay, so lot lines are what make subdivision happen. And lot line placement can be regulated. In this example, the sensitive areas have been protected not only by permit or easement, but also by drawing the lot lines so that they are best managed as a whole and protected as a whole. Site restrictions would be the next best way to achieve this. And I'll talk more about that on the next slide, but lot lines are gonna be the most effective here. So looking at the graphic, uh, the left layout over here creates 
a rather disjointed settlement and is very disruptive to the land, really all of the land. Um, and the appeal of this layout, you know, might be that there's a lot of distance between the homes and lots of privacy. You can even see that a number of the homes are just fully in the woods over here and down here. But the forest block is functionally compromised, to say the least. The layout on the right, on the other hand, places homes much closer together and leaves significant amounts of forest up here and also over here uh, intact. And this is what we would call an ecologically conscious cluster development. That is these homes all together right here. And as you'll see soon, it is possible to preserve rural character in a cluster development, even though it seems like these homes are much, much closer together. So alternatively, you could approach forest block preservation with site restrictions. You can build envelopes to approximately site structures and these should be flagged on the ground. This gives a developer some flexibility for home placement as seen on the right. You know, there's still some flexibility in where you put the home uh, because they could go anywhere in this envelope here. But there's not as much flexibility as there is on the left over here. And we don't want uh, quite this much flexibility. Um, as you can see over here, it says bad. Over here, it says good. Um, and the right is good because there's much more forest preservation. You could also establish cut lines or ground disturbance boundaries, which should also be flagged on the ground. Okay, so the last visual for this section, you can let them go here in these red circles, um, or you can tell them they can't and force them to go over here or over here. And in the right graphic, the roads and buildings, they're all tucked away in the natural landscape, uh, whether it be this narrow strip of trees here or the bigger blocks, they're all fairly well tucked away. And that leads to minimal disruption of forests and open spaces. So one point here that I think this graphic demonstrates really well is the impact of development. And what I mean by that is that development comes with, it's not just the development itself, it comes with roads and cars, driveways, septic, and so on. And so the impacts of development add up very quickly. And that is all the more reason why we should be thinking critically about the placement of developments and why we should be regulating them with ecologically conscious subdivision bylaws. Okay, so this next and last part of the training will clarify the concept of rural density. This matters because as we've seen, clustering homes is a necessary part of ecologically conscious subdivision. And we use the phrase rural density here to distinguish the type of density that we're talking about from the sort of density that you might expect to see in a town center, for example, because preserving rural character is something that our towns value and something that is absolutely still obtainable. So these next few slides are meant to show you what rural density looks like or can look like, and also that preserving rural character and preserving forests are not mutually exclusive. Okay, so rural density refers to the ecologically conscious placement of developments relatively close together compared to the size of the lot while still reasonably distanced. One emphasize that last clause there, while still reasonably distanced. Rural density gives you the same number of buildings per original parcel, but on a much smaller portion of the land to protect forest blocks. 
and there will be some visuals in just a moment to help you see what we're talking about. Rural density also preserves rural character in areas without public sewer and water and can lessen development costs while maintaining land value and also meeting conservation objectives. Okay, so here are a few different development scenarios, if you will. On the left is a parcel before development. You can see two main roads intersect here. And there's some fragmentation because of those roads, uh, but it's pretty minimal. And then in the middle, you can see the same forest block almost entirely cleared by three spaghetti lots, as we call them. Each has a long driveway and has been cleared almost entirely of, of the trees. Um, and this really exemplifies a worst case scenario from the conservation perspective, at least. Lots of forest is gone and the development, including houses and driveways, chop up the land leaving very little room for wildlife to pass through. The appeal of this sort of development, as, we've, as I've already mentioned, is that houses probably have a much more rural feel and they have lots of privacy. And then on the right here, we've got a cluster development, which is the best case scenario. This is what we call rural density right here at least the aerial view of it. The clearing of and disruption to the forest are pretty minimal. Driveways branch off of each other, uh, come out of this main one, uh, minimizing the driveway length, which is much different than what we see over here with these very long driveways. And houses also maintain a fair amount of privacy, as you can see, especially with this one, due to the placement of these trees here. Here's the same idea again. On the left, we've got an undeveloped parcel and then a worst case scenario in the middle and a best case scenario for developments on the right. Notice how in the middle, the entire field contains disjointed development and the whole right edge here has um, offshoots of development with these long driveways um, and then if you look at this right hand panel, at first glance, it looks almost the same as the left hand one. And that is the goal. It's not to conserve all of the land because that feels a little bit unrealistic. But instead, the goal is to develop it in ecologically conscious ways that preserve its integrity and its value, especially uh, its value for wildlife. So, with this, uh, right graphic here, you can see two cluster developments. We've got one on the right edge and then one here on the bottom left. And especially with the cluster in the bottom left, it's clear that houses maintain at least some degree of privacy due to all of the trees around. So as the last two slides should have demonstrated, Rural density is the intentional clustering of developments on large parcels to maintain forest blocks. And rural character and privacy really are still attainable. So in all the cases that we're talking about, one unit per one acre is usually just about what we're aiming for. And one acre is about three quarters of a football field. In case that doesn't resonate with you, it is also about the size of 10 basketball courts. So it's pretty big. Uh, when I think about that, you know, my first reaction is that that's pretty sizable. So you might be able to see your neighbors in a parcel with multiple one unit per one acre lots, but you probably won't be right next to them. And you might not even be able to see them super well. So up next, I've got a number of aerial and street view photos from streets in Vermont towns to show you what exactly 
this would look like. So these examples are all from Aquichi. This one's specifically on Baker Turn Road. And we're focusing on this house right here, which is on a 1.25 acre lot. And you'll see that you can see a neighbor over here and over here from the aerial view, but it doesn't feel like the houses are right next to each other. So here's the front view from the street. This unit exemplifies moderately thick tree cover on both sides, I would say. Here's the side view. So you can see the roof of the neighboring house over here. There's no hiding that it's there. It certainly is, but it's also not right next door. And then here's the other side view. You can see the other neighbor as well through these trees here, but it's pretty heavily forested. <clears throat> and this is zoomed in on the backyard to again, emphasize the surrounding woods. One drawback is that the house is fairly close to the street, but so much valuable forest is preserved behind the home, which makes it worth it. And another benefit of a short driveway that comes to mind pretty immediately because of the recent snow is that it's much cheaper to plow a shorter driveway in the winter. And certainly other reasons as well. Okay, so now we're back to the aerial view of that same house you just saw from the street view, which is this one. And I wanted to show the transition from street view back to aerial view because Aerial view is like, likely the perspective that you'll be drawing subdivision lot lines or envelopes from, um, which is why I wanted to return. And one of the biggest challenges here is visualizing for yourself what lots and developments will look like on the ground when you've only been working on 2D bird's eye view maps. And then on top of that, you need to help your town members visualize these outcomes as well. So hopefully these street view translations, if you will, that is street view images from aerial view uh, are gonna be helpful with that process. This stretch of houses is all, they're all about one unit per one acre. Some of them are a little bit bigger than an acre, uh, but close enough for our purposes. There are houses on each side of nearly all of the houses. Um, and there's also considerable variation in both how visible the houses are from the road and how visible the neighbors are, depending largely on the, the tree placement around the houses. So now we'll take a look at this house. This one up here, this one's on a 1.28 acre lot and surrounded by houses on both sides. Here is the front street view. This house is very visible from the road, as you can see, and also set pretty far back from the street. Here's the side view. You can see houses, or this one house through the trees. Um, these trees are much less abundant than in the previous example, um, but they do provide some privacy. Here's a zoomed in view of the backyard, again, to show the remaining forest that's preserved back there. And here is the other side view. Again, trees left in place for some privacy between the lots. And now we're gonna move down here. And this ne next example is a house on a 1.5 acre lot. This example finds some middle ground in that it's somewhat covered by trees uh, from the front street view and also still visible from the road. Here's the side view. The neighboring house 
definitely still visible, but pretty far off in the distance um, and not, not right next to the house and not crazy visible. On the other side, you can't see the neighbors at all. So this is again, a nice example of a middle ground. You can see one neighbor a little bit, the other neighbor not at all, and sort of visible from the street, but not as visible as, as that first example. This next house is on a 1.1 acre lot. This is the final example, um, and it is of a house that is barely visible from the road and no neighbors can be seen. So I did not bother with the slightly to the left and slightly to the right view. Um, so here we've seen quite the spectrum of possibilities for ways to approach um, one unit per one acre subdivision. And depending on your subdivision bylaws, development, developments could have lots of privacy like this home here or less privacy like we saw with that first home. So these visuals were to show what an acre, give or take, looks like from street view and what it means for the preservation of rural character. These images show that rural character can indeed be maintained through clustering. And this was also show what subdivisions, which would look a lot like these lot lines here, uh, can simultaneously allow for sustainable development and preserve forest blocks. So these are some resources that we used in making this presentation and we highly recommend taking a look if you are interested in learning more. And that brings us to the end of this, this forest block training. Thank you all so much for listening. If you have any questions, Lincoln, Kevin, and I are gonna stick around to answer them. Feel free to use the chat or you can raise your hand or and unmute yourself. Thanks, Izzy. That was great. And Lincoln too. I do have a, just a, a housekeeping thing while everybody's right here. Um, first off in the chat, uh, some people have wondered if they can get a copy of the presentation, um, but we can only give you a copy if we know how to find you. So, uh, you can just put your email in the chat and that way we'll uh, archive that and we'll have all that over there. Uh, we'll also have this on the Two Rivers website. So TROrc.org. We have a, a, a video part up top, a YouTube channel. And so we put all our trainings and stuff over there and so you can find it there um, if we miss you. However, we're supposed to also get a little evaluation and the state used to give us a this quite a, a lengthy evaluation sheet. Now they don't require that anymore, which is nice. Um, so, uh, I'm just going to ask you to do a little quick evaluation by using the little thumbs up uh, thing. So if you go down to uh, the reactions down bottom, and if you liked this, you can give it a thumbs up. If you really liked it, you can give it two thumbs up. Um, or you can kind of do the, the, you know, the party <laughs> or whatever. Um, if you didn't like it, you can do the crying face. Um, and, and that would, that would be sad. Uh, but uh, but we will capture this. And so what literally I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a picture of all the little thumbs, which is nice. Um, and then we can we can get get the questions and the answers. I have been seeing um, a couple things in the chat over here. So I'm going to go to that those questions in just a second. But I'm seeing some people's emails, which is really nice to see. OK, um, so I see a question which is, are you able to comment on how recreational development impacts the benefit of forest blocks? Oh, good question. So not just the houses and roads and stuff, but other things, um, specifically hiking, mountain biking, and ATV trails. So this may be a question more for Lincoln. I can take the, yeah, first first crack out of it. Um, yeah, that's a tough one, especially, you know, with ATV and, and hiking, those are very different uses, but we do see them overlapping a lot with multi-use trails and in forests and parks across the state. Um, I think where there are density of trails already, 
you know, what I'm hearing is, you know, I mean, all wildlife are going to need different things and, and react differently, but where there is density of people sort of like development, the wildlife know that already. And if you're just increasing, if you're talking about building new trail in those areas, it's going to be less impactful than um, say expanding the trail network um, to like increase the, the area in the forest that maybe was, you know, un, unfragmented, so to speak in the area. Um, so we have, it's a balance, you know, because the community values, they call for these recreational activities and we need to plan for those just like we need to plan for wildlife corridors. So something that works in one town isn't going to work in the next town, but we're all sort of faced with the same dilemmas. Uh, that's a good question. Is he, Kevin, if you got anything to add? I, I would just add the concepts are, are pretty similar and that, you know, you, you seek the edge, you seek um, a place where there is a bunch of stuff um, and you just try to keep big chunks intact and not, you know, not go through the middle of the Mona Lisa. Uh, any other questions? You, and you don't need to use the chat. I know some people are like, where's that button down there? That's how, how I often am on our Zoom. You can just uh, turn your video on, unmute yourself and, and like wiggle your hand around and ask a question if you want. Not seeing any questions, but maybe I don't. I'm um, just checking and making sure I got everybody out there. Um, anybody seeing any hands up? No. Okay. Um, we're happy to stay and answer questions, but uh, if you don't have any further questions, you can feel free to go have supper or whatever. Um, and thank you again, Izzy and Lincoln. Great job for doing this. And uh, oh, I see maybe Greg, do you have a question, Greg? I do, I do, I do. Um, I hope I can get it all together. Um, so we're out here in Versher, pretty rural. Um, certainly we're thinking about trails and how the future coming toward us and how to adjust ourselves to uh meet that future that makes the most sense All right so we we want to tailor our town plan to to kind of um have that in its background some common sense so one thing um in our health section um it's it basically the person just checks houses that are you know deteriorating and that kind of thing so i was looking at the uh mental health uh page on the vermont state kind of thing and it seems to me that we should that bringing a lot of that and putting that in our health plan would be a good thing to do considering it seems like the future coming in is going to have more mental health issues and if we have that kind of service it'll help keep our town and the community um tighter rather than more frag like the forest <laughs> We fragment the people or we bring them in the block. You know, so the community is the block, kind of. And so that would be a way to nurture that. Does, what, does the planning board enact the activity of actualizing that? Or is that delegated out? Or does that fall under the planning board's um, authority, I guess, or, or mission? Um, to create the actual center that would house those kind of services the health bills talking about um virtually everything the planning board the planning commission does is is kind of an advisory role um and so most of that type of stuff then later gets enacted or gets kind of legs by the select board um, because it usually involves a building or some money or you know hiring somebody and so most of those things um uh, uh, whether it's adopting a bylaw or, you know, having a service in town, um, usually it's the select board that you're ending, ending up at. Thank you. That's, sure. I see Sabina's hand. Yeah. Hi. This is going to be one of those things where all of my questions are going to come to me like in an hour. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's okay. You have our, you have our email there. You just send them to us. Um, but one that just did pop in um, was what what your opinions on shared septic are versus um, 
individual in, in this kind of rural design? Sure. Um, you could easily do shared septic. Uh, one of the, uh, like in one of the slides as he had, where you have some open lands and you put the tree, the, the houses a little bit into the trees. Uh, it's obviously hard to put the septic in there with the trees, but you could put shared septic out at the edge of that field. Yep. It's, um, we have a lot of, we have some towns that actually have that as their system, but easily in these subdivisions, you, you could do it, build it that way. Yeah. Thanks. And, and especially um, if you put the house close to the Is one preferable to another or is it really just? It's, it saves you a little time. By case. It saves you a little time and money. In this example that is, he has, you know, these houses are relatively far apart from each other. But uh, is if you want, if you go to the one with the bigger field and the more houses, um, I'm assuming you're driving the pictures there. Yeah, here uh, you could see that 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 uh, side road on the right and that subdivision down on the left. Both of those could could put things over into those fields. Whereas if you're scattering the houses all through the field, like you are in the middle one, it's going to be a little more difficult, or you know because you're just going to have everybody all over the place and you're going to be buying a lot of pipe. Mm -hmm. And how about things like, um, I know up here, I, can, I mean, we're a little more crowded up here in Chittenden County, but um, I mean, we're encouraging things like ADUs and, or at least, um, sure. you know, capacity for that kind of thing. Um, does that fit into this model? Uh, it does a little bit, certainly, um, by, uh, I was at a, or was I was at a meeting last night, um, and talking about this a little bit, but part of that is if you think about the overall number of people, where they're going to go, the more we can have those accessory dwelling units, the ADUs, um, in our villages, the less pressure there is out in the forest. Um, so we can relieve a lot of that pressure by giving some housing types available in villages, Yeah. Hmm. It's kind of the yin yang part of life. Thank you so much. Excellent presentation. Thank you. Um, and I dropped a video in the chat that the, that is a dissertation presentation um, by a field natural student from UVM who did a whole project study on wildlife impact and, and trail use. Just to go back to that question, so that's a good that's a good YouTube presentation. going to uh lee i see um you joined us late but yes we will have a recording of this totally available and then izzy unfortunately has to go back to school um and so we will lose her but lincoln and i uh will be around and so our emails are over there uh, kevin this is eric webb i've got a yeah. quick question um and it's well it's not a quick question <laughs> Uh, the question is quick, but the answer is probably not. The, I'm zooming this out just a little bit, and we're looking at um, you know, protecting the forest blocks, minimizing fragmentation, and other issues like affordable housing. All of those need to derive from the town plan, mm -hmm. or the planning commission can um, include you know, comporting language. So um, the town plan, revision is such a slow process and such an involved process um, that our question is, or my question is, how can we, how can we, um, what can we do in the bylaws, as you know, we're, we're revising ours now, uh, mm -hmm. to, to implement some of this without violating or at least ignoring what's not in the town plan. Ah, this, this is a good question. So this is a, a kind of um, a plan and bylaw relationship question. And that is why it's 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 good to put something in your town plan versus putting nothing in your town plan that gives you the foundation to do this. And even though that something may, be, um, may feel a little wishy-washy, so stuff in your town plan that says, you know, the town should consider um, – ways to reduce fragmentation in bylaws that gives you a, like a huge wide opening there to do that all sorts of things it doesn't force you to um 
it doesn't get you into that conversation of, well, what's the bylaw going to say right now? We're like, well, we're going to have that conversation when we do the bylaw, but we're just giving ourselves a little bit of direction right now. So something like that might be relatively easy to pass and, and gives you all the stuff there. Uh, if there is nothing in the town plan, um, then it becomes difficult to do it later. But usually there's something in the town plan on the wildlife section or something. The other side, though, comes up a lot where the town plan has been very specific and, you know, has said, you know, in in this area, everything should be 10 acres. And, and you go, well, wait a minute, we want to do the thing Izzy just said, and we're going to do one acres and leave most of the 10 acres aside. But the town plan just said we have to be 10 acres out here. So be careful about being being too, too specific um, and running into an unintended consequence in the town plan. But I would bet you um, we're seeing uh, only a few cases where the town plan is actually too constrictive or doesn't give us enough to, to do this type of stuff. Great. Thank you. Lee. Hi, can you hear me? Yep. Um, so there's a, I think there's a real tension between property rights and and conserving forest blocks and wildlife. Totally. So we ran into this recently, and I think I emailed you, Kevin, that a road was uh, allowed to be extended into 125 acres. Yes. Mm -hmm. of, um, you know, land, I think it's in current use because it was logged, but uh, there was nothing really we could do to stop it, even though the town plan says we should avoid forest fragmentation and all that. This road was 1,400 feet of new road into, you know, into the heart of the forest block. But um, I actually asked around a little bit and I was told that um, the, the law, the legal precedent does not like landlocked parcels where the owners can't um, do what do what their property rights allow them to do, which is build a house and develop and etc. Mm -hmm. So even if we had wrongly allowed that road extension, since these people already have bought the land, it's very uh, unlikely that we could stop it because they could appeal to the court and win. So this was the argument that was given to me. It was kind of, I don't know if I, I said it in a comprehensible way, but basically legal precedent does not like landlocked parcels. It, it, it doesn't. Yeah. Uh, so a, a couple of things, uh, you, there's several little parts of that, Lee. Um, you cannot create a landlocked parcel in Vermont. So it's illegal to make one. Sometimes there actually is one out there. Usually what we find on on a parcel that looks landlocked, if you were to look at the lines on the map, is that they have a right of way. Um, way back long ago, somebody gave them a right of way, but they didn't build a road. They just have a legal right of way to go from point A to point B. Um, and so sooner or later, they will come along and build that road through the forest. And, and that's true. You can't say, no, 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 you can't do that unless you want to just buy their lot. <laughs> you, you, you could say, um, wait a minute, we, we, we're going to regulate the road itself and the road is going to have to go here or the road, you know, they just have a right to get to their parcel. They don't have a right to go round and round and round in their parcel. Um, and so you can say, maybe your, your house is going to be over here on the edge and you're not, not back in that corner where you want. And, and that is a, that's a tension that we face a lot with uh, towns and landowners is people think that they have an, an unfettered right to their land and how they're going to use their land. And that is not true. Um, as much as they might like to feel that way, that's not true. Uh, there is all sorts of abilities for the towns to regulate uh, what goes where, and that's totally legal and totally constitutional, um, as long as you give them reasonable use of their property. And so by regulating where you go, you still get a house, you still get to put on your land, um, but you don't get to just be willy-nilly and you know, cut the bone lease in half. Um, just because you think you should, uh, that is totally allowable. That's one of those cases, I think in Europe, that particular case you brought up, it was just inside of one parcel boundary. Was that right? It wasn't a subdivision. It was more of like one big giant parcel. It was one giant parcel. And there was an, there was a, an old road there 
that was apparently still mapped by the town. The contention was whether it was mapped all the way to the line mm -hmm. of that landlocked parcel or whether there was a chunk in between that may or may not have been thrown up. But right. anyway, the select board didn't go there. They just sort of accepted the argument of the the buyer's lawyer that said, hey, look, this is a road where they should be allowed to, to make a road to their land. And Yeah, and, and that, that was probably true. Um, the And that's where subdivision for those future lots we're creating, um, where the subdivision by lot comes in and says, you know, we're not going to make these big, crazy lots out there. We're going to make the lots over here. Once you've got a lot, though, as Izzy said, the cow's kind of out of the barn most of the time on that. However, uh, towns can certainly uh, choose to regulate the driveways themselves as development. Mm -hmm. And so instead of just going, oh, well, you know, you've got a great big parcel. As long as you're 20 feet from the lot lines, who knows what you're going to do around the middle? Um, no, towns could say, oh, we have a maximum intrusion into the forest setback. So essentially, we're, we're, we're kind of treating the forest like a thing and you have to you can only go into it a certain distance or you only go into a field a certain distance or your road itself is a regulatable structure and we're going to have standards about where you put that thing so you're not just doing all sorts of things stream crossings you know going too steep um or going right through the middle of a forest and, and still giving them reasonable use of the property so all those things can come into play but it's a whole lot easier to do it from the get-go with the subdivision. That's why Izzy was bringing that up. Great. Uh, let me see. I don't, I'm just uh, scrolling and back and forth and seeing if I see anybody else there. Do you see anybody else, Izzy or Lincoln, with a question? I'm seeing a lot I'm of stuff in the chat. Great. And Izzy, you will uh, archive the chat. You're Pressing some magic button that I don't know how to press. Okay. Oh, I'll play with it and make sure I have it before before I leave the meeting. I think I've done that before in the oh oh yeah yeah if you're at that and actually anybody else can do this too if you're in the chat and you go way over you'll see the little three dots there and if you click that little three dots it'll say save chat. Now save the chat for you. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly what I did. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody, for coming. Thanks for all the work you do. Um, again, uh, if you. you're if you're not one of our towns, I know Moncton was here and uh, a couple other towns were here. Uh, your other your regional planning commission, wherever they are, uh, they pretty much know this stuff like we do. Um, and so I'm sure that they can help you along with working on this. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a good oh, night. Bye. Okay, thanks. And Izzy, you're you're the host, so you're the last one out. Mm -hmm. Yep, I'll be the last one out. You have to I'm clean gonna... up all the pl plates and, you know, 